gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. I dread, I know I am forgiven. 
Good morning. For those, for those who weren't here last week, the reason we have a keyboard up here, and I'm playing up here, Julie is still feeling ill, um, and I was scheduled to fill in for three weeks starting last Sunday, and so in order to prevent running back and forth to the piano, we put the keyboard up here, so you only have to put up with it for one more week. Let's stand and begin our worship. On this Sunday, we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's take a moment, if you're comfortable, and share the peace with one another. Greet one another in Jesus' name. Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This building on last week, if I tell you to sit and it says in the bulletin to stand, just ignore me. <laughs> Start going back and forth. I don't want to make you keep getting up and getting down more than Lutherans usually do. <laughs>
The lesson is from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and verses 28 through 32. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so also they are now, they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all the disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Please stand if you're able for the gospel. Our gospel reading is from Matthew, chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. And Matthew writes, Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when you, they heard what you had said? He answered, Every plant my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. All right. So a little game of observation this morning. What do you see? Hands. Okay. Look closer. What do you see? Fingers? What else? Yeah. A ring? Yes. I'm married. What else do you see? If you dirt. <laughs> Maybe some glistening of sweat because I was playing piano. What do you see? Fingerprints. Okay. Does anybody see anything else on there that's like what? Veins. Maybe some lines going across. You know what I see? I, I, I see knuckles. I see wrinkles on my knuckles. I, I see fingernails. Do you see the fingernails? No. Okay. Why do we see the same thing and it looks different to both of us? What side are you looking at? You're looking at this side? What side am I looking at? 
This side. Okay, let's all stand up here and get in a circle here real quick. And if you're comfortable with this, we're going to hold hands. Okay. Come on. Yeah, you two hold hands there. And when we're holding hands, now take a look at your hand. We'll all see the same thing, won't we? Well, that's the way it is in the kingdom of God and in church is sometimes we look at things from different perspectives, but when we join together and we love one another and we hold hands, then we can start seeing things together and we can move forward the way God wants us to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mornings that we can get together with you. We thank you for the mornings where there's school, for the mornings there's sunshine, and the mornings there's rain. You give us so much love. Help us to show that love to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, head back. Grace and peace to you from our God and Father, God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As we have for the last two weeks, let's start with... Uh, moment of silence to kind of get ourselves prepared, center ourselves, whatever language you'd like to use, and be ready to hear whatever message God might have for our hearts. Heavenly Father, help us to look with your eyes, listen with your ears, and love with your heart. Give us the faith to explode anything that doesn't come from you and remove all the barriers that keep us from loving you. In Jesus' name, amen. I grew up in a small church on the southwest side of Indianapolis. Now, in those days, back in the 60s, the ancient 60s, there were some traditions in church that were just accepted kind of universally. If a man didn't wear a button-up shirt and a tie, and a woman wasn't dressed up and wearing high heels where you just weren't doing church right. And if someone showed up in blue jeans, oh the horror, and they might even be asked to leave. Maybe some of you have similar experiences from those days. It's even stranger when we stop and think about where those traditions came from. Ties were originally napkins that men would tuck in their shirt when they were having a meal. As time went on, the napkins got fancier and fancier to display how much wealth you had. And then because there's dinner right after church, people started wearing them to church. Button-up shirts were originally for women because in the original churches facing the front like this, women would sit on the left and men would sit on the right and a woman's shirt buttons on the left-hand side so that there would be a little bit of modesty and privacy if a baby needed fed. When men started wearing button-up shirts, they buttoned theirs on the right because most people being right-handed would wear their sword and scabbard on the left, and if you draw your sword, that prevents your wrist from getting caught on the material that was there. And high heels, all you lucky women, that was originally worn by butchers to keep them up out of the leavings from, from their work. All in all, it's a rather unimpressive beginning for church traditions. The Pharisees in the first century had their own traditions, what they would call the traditions of the elders. Uh, a lot of the origins are lost to history, but in their minds, these traditions were every bit as important as the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. One of these traditions, a ritual washing, in which water was poured over your hand three times while reciting, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through your commandments and has commanded us concerning the washing of hands. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these traditions, whether it's wearing ties or high heels or washing your hands. The problem comes in when the traditions become more important than the heart that seeks after God, 
and can sometimes get in the way of someone seeking after God. Now, in our reading today, Jesus deals with tradition and hardness of hearts, callousness on the heart, with both the Pharisees and the disciples. The reading begins, and he called the people to him. Now, just like last week when we wanted to know why did Jesus have to go up on the mountain, and we went back and looked at the context, we want to do that today. So before our reading, it says that the Pharisees came to Jesus and started to chide him. Why is it, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders by not washing their hands before eating? Well, as Jesus so often does, he doesn't answer their question. He confronts them about not caring for their elderly parents, which is a commandment. And they actually made traditions for reasons why they shouldn't have to care for their elderly parents. And they held their traditions more important than the commandments of God. Then he called the people together to teach them. What follows may be the most startling thing that Jesus ever said for the first century Jew. It's not what goes into a person that defiles them and makes them unclean, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles you. Jesus explains to his disciples later that what comes out of your mouth reveals what is in your heart and whether you have a heart for loving God and loving other people or whether you're more concerned with just the outward appearance of being good. The Pharisees were offended and the disciples went and told Jesus the Pharisees are offended. Now, why were they offended? And why is this one of the most shocking things that Jesus would ever say? Because in this statement, he wipes away traditions and he abolishes the Levitical uh, dietary regulations and food regulations. He was basically saying, God doesn't care what you eat. What he cares about is what is in your heart and what comes out. This scripture is the reason we can enjoy the wonderful gift from God that we call bacon. Can I get an amen? amen. That's my Lutheran fellowship. But see, um, no wonder what the scribes, no wonder the scribes and Pharisees were shocked. The very ground of their religion was cut from beneath their feet. This statement was not simply alarming, it was revolutionary. And if Jesus is right, I'm pretty sure he is, then rather than religion being important, it's a relationship with God and having God's heart that is most important. They identified pleasing God with the observing of rules and regulations, which had to do with being clean, and of course that means everybody else is unclean. Jesus identifies pleasing God with the state of an individual's heart and said bluntly that these regulations had nothing to do with a relationship with God. Jesus is expanding on his teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So if this is Jesus' teaching, it's a teaching that condemns every one of us that none of us can be good by following rules and regulations. We can only be called good when our heart is pure. That fact in itself is the very end of pride. And it's the reason why every one of us can only say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, Jesus wants to know if the disciples have learned this lesson. So he takes them north of Galilee into Tyre and Sidon. Apart from anything else, it describes the only occasion in his adult life where Jesus was outside of a Jewish territory. The supreme significance of this is that it foreshadows the going out of the gospel into all the world and the beginning of the end of all barriers between peoples. For Jesus, it was a time of deliberate withdrawal. He wanted the privacy to tell his disciples things in preparation for his own death. 
There was no place in Israel where he could be guaranteed privacy because the crowds were following him wherever he would go. But the Jewish crowds would not travel to a Gentile region. And so they were able to rest and he was able to do some teaching with them. Now it's no secret that the children of Abraham, the Jews, had no love for the Gentiles. That's us. Even though the promise to Abraham was that through you, all families on the earth will be blessed. They only sought to distance themselves from anyone who wasn't like them. And by the way, the Jewish men looked upon women in much the same way with an orthodox prayer that ended, and you can look this up, Oh God, I thank you that I was not made a Gentile, a woman, or a dog. So for the disciples, this trip was going to explode their traditions regarding Gentiles and women and to remove calluses from their hearts to consider other people before themselves. So a woman, not just a woman, a Gentile woman. Not just a Gentile woman, a Canaanite Gentile woman. Canaanites were the old enemies of Israel. Comes to Jesus and she begs, Have mercy on me, Lord, O son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. How uncomfortable is the silence? Jesus didn't respond to her. Have you ever prayed, made a request to God, and you felt like the answer was silence? Did that stop you? She continued crying to him. Now wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't the Jesus we know and love. Where's the Jesus who said, call the children to come to me? Where's the Jesus who seemed to stop at every bend in the road to see the next poor person or sick person or lame person or blind person? Where's the Jesus who set aside his own grief, had compassion on the crowds, and fed the five to 10,000 with a few loaves and a few fish? And how did she come to him? She called him Lord. She called him Son of David. How is it this Gentile Canaanite woman recognizes who Jesus is when most of his people don't realize who he is? Even Peter doesn't really comprehend who Jesus is until later in the gospel, and we'll be talking about that next week. But she continues to call out to Jesus. Now his disciples are getting annoyed. And what do they say to him? <laughs> Give her what she wants and send her away. Where's the compassion in that statement? How does that show the heart of God? So Jesus responds, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now that's not a response you want to hear. But I guarantee it's what the disciples were thinking. She doesn't give up. She kneels before him and says, Lord, help me. I imagine he probably looked around at the disciples at that point, saw where their hearts were. Um, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Wow, how uncomfortable is that? That's worse than the silence. He called her a dog. Now, not the pariah, which were the dogs who used to run around the streets and go to the garbage heaps, but a cunaria, which is like a pet dog in the house, a lap dog. And I have to wonder if the disciples were uncomfortable or were they finally thinking it, oh, wow, at last, he sees it our way. She still doesn't give up. And we shouldn't give up when placing our needs before God. Yes, Lord, she says. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answers, great is your faith, woman. 
let it be as you desire, and her daughter was healed in that moment. She came to Jesus calling him Lord and recognizing that here was someone who could heal her daughter. How did she leave? By bowing before him in worship and placing herself under the lordship of Christ. And the disciples, they wanted to send her away. Their hearts were calloused by their tradition of Gentiles being unclean. They hadn't learned much from Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees earlier in this chapter, and they did not recognize a heart that was seeking after God. They only saw an unclean Canaanite Gentile woman. So not only was the Pharisees' world shaken, the disciples' world was shaken. Have you ever thought you knew something only to find out later you were wrong? I have. These brains of ours are a blessing and a curse. Humans are inquisitive by nature. We try to understand the world around us, but once we have an understanding, good luck getting us off of that. Social scientists call this confirmation bias. Basically, whatever we see in the world, we're going to interpret to support whatever belief we have, whatever ideas we have. This is true in politics. This is true in religion, it's true in relationships, and you know it's true on Facebook. I had the privilege of traveling to New Orleans about six months before Katrina hit in the early 2000s. And in New Orleans, there's a fine line between art and vandalism. And one artist had taken these little placards, put a black border around them, a white center with black lettering, nailed them to light posts all over town, and what they said was, think you might be wrong? And I still remember seeing those and thinking about the people that needed to read them. The problem of sticking fiercely to what we think we know is that our hearts become callous to other people. And this prevents any hope of overcoming differences between us. We have to give up the commitment to being right and learn to ask the question, I wonder. Whenever you ask the question, I wonder, you're displaying the heart of God. I wonder what it's like to be him. I wonder what it's like to be her. You know what we call it when we set, set aside ourselves for the sake of another? We call that love. To love our neighbor as ourself, to love our neighbor enough to ask, I wonder what it's like. That's the first step, regardless of whether we believe or agree with them or not. I wonder what it's like to struggle with chronic illness. I wonder what it's like to be a single parent. I wonder what it's like to be responsible for a business. I wonder what it's like to be a police officer at this moment in time. I wonder what it's like to survive sexual assault. I wonder what it's like to be Jewish and see all the attacks on the synagogues in the recent years. I wonder what it's like to live 80 years and then watch the world change dramatically. I wonder what it's like to be 16 and gay. I wonder what it's like to be proud of Confederate ancestors. I wonder what it's like to be an African American living in a predominantly white community. To love our neighbor is the first step to sharing the gospel with them. To get past the notion that we already know everything we need to know and ask, I wonder. To love our neighbor is to ask, I wonder, before interacting with someone who has different life experiences. And then we share our hearts. Then we show love. And when the world sees the people of God asking, I wonder, and sharing all we are regardless of our differences, then we're displaying the heart of God that is pure. And we're able to lead them to Jesus so they are able to love him as we do. There's nothing wrong with traditions, really, so long as they don't come between us and God 
and present roadblocks to other people from coming to God. And when there is a people of God who are joining hands together, lifting the weak, feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, taking in those with need, there's no tradition that feels better than that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you give us all our needs, and so often you give us our wants as well. We want to ask, who is there on your heart that you would have us love? Help us to tear the calluses of our heart away, that we display the love that you give to each one of us every day. And that that love draws other people to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. pass the plates in a time of offering. We have the offering plate in back. Feel free to drop something in, whatever God has blessed you with. The church depends on the generosity of Christians to share love, to share ministry, 
to teach children, to provide meals. So be sure and be generous. And for those of you at home, if you would like to give through the website, online, I believe the, uh, the URL link is there. Feel free to click on that. faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the life that you have given us. Thank you for the love that you have shown. Thank you for the mercy that covers us every day and that your mercies are new every morning. We ask in this time that you would help us to be merciful as well. That your love would shine out from us like a bright light. And that who we are would step out of the way and draw people directly to you. And Father, we ask that you would be with those who are, who are healing, who are sick, who are in need, or who have need of our sympathy for deaths. We pray that you'd be with Greg, Pat, Cheryl, Susan, Marion, Bill, Dan, Jim, Max, and for those relatives and friends of member, Larry, Bill, Randall, Mary, Jeannie, Alan, Joyce, Bob, Carol, Linda, Scott, Soyoung, Julie, Jolyn, Darlene, Carol, and we just pray that you would that you would give grace and comfort to the inskeeps on the loss of Cheryl's 106-year-old 
great uncle Russell. May all things we do be in your name, for your glory and for your love. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after dinner, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he blessed it and said, drink you all of it. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. As long as you eat this bread, and drink this wine. You remember me until I come. Let's share the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Anyone who's a baptized believer is welcome to take part in communion here. Uh, for those at home, some bread, grape juice, and wine, feel free to take it. We would like to invite you to come up to the rail, fill in from here and go. It's a continuous communion. If you prefer to take it in your seat, then feel free to take the elements as we're taking communion up here.
please stand if you're able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace and peace now and forever. continue to post our worship services online. We have them streaming live, so be sure to go to the website or Facebook. Uh, I think there's a YouTube channel, and we'll be back together next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Go in peace and serve the Lord.
how you can grow in peace and so forth.